You have been warned. Here's the good news. The more conscious we are that this is what we're doing, and we're, the faster it happens. We're getting up here and we're saying in the mainstream thing, hey, and I get called an idiot and a crackpot on CNN, which is their, their, their network, right? The advantage of the liberated planet Earth from the negative of the New World Order are the legitimate forces of the Galactic Federations and the force of consciousness. And we have a timetable for that, and that is that paradise on Earth We're in a transitional period now. Uh, here is uh, uh, just Michael Prince Cockney says, these are the most joyful and angelic children talking about his fellow super soldiers of clusters of dimensions within the multiverse itself. This core cluster of dimensions we can by convention call the spiritual dimensions. Empirical data also tell us that there's a secondary cluster of dimensions in the multiverse that is a continual creation of intelligent civilizations within the spiritual dimension. This, this by convention, we can call the exopolitical dimensions. The purposes of the dimensional ecology are to facilitate evolution of higher consciousness and moral growth in all dimensions of the multiverse through a variety of interdimensional and interdimensional activities. For example, souls and interdimensional beings from the spiritual dimensions may incarnate as extraterrestrial, extraterrestrials in the exopolitical dimensions and by acquiring the moral experience of life as, say, an earthling or Martian human advance their individual soul development. So that's the essential kind of model or hypothesis or experimental finding. Uh, now, different major aspects of the spiritual dimension. Souls. One central mission of the multiverse appears to be the creation and development of souls that in turn can grow into spiritual beings that can become godlike or source-like and participate in the creation of universes in the multiverse. God is light. Replicable data from hypnotic regression of soul memories from the human afterlife inform us that one aspect of God or source can be described as vast, a vast field of living light. Earthly human souls, including yours and mine, are formed as eggs of light from that field of light in a yet unrevealed mass production light process. The souls from the afterlife who've been exposed to the production process of souls say, hey, it's almost like mass production. That these souls that come off of the field of light, now, I'm, this is an oversimplification, but that's what happens. God is a spiritual dimension. The most reliable hypothesis based on experimental data consisting of thousands of cases of soul memories of the interlife is that the God or source responsible for the multi multiverse is the totality of the spiritual dimensions. In other words, the vast sea of light, you know, that let's just say that we are holograms of and all the beings in the spiritual dimension. Collectively, we're all God. So we are now in the process, even as being here, of creating new dimensions and new universes in the multiverse. We're not just hanging around. Human souls are God holograms. Thus, the entire civilization of human souls and of spiritual beings in the spiritual dimensions, participate in and make up God. This includes your human soul and mine. Our souls are hol hologrammatically and actually components of God or source. Okay, let me see what time it is. We have about 15 minutes. We, we can start. Now, from a scientific perspective using 
the, the scientific method, which is essentially laboratory protocol and replicable results. That is the scientific method, and that gives you official knowledge. That's the, that's the convention. Uh, there are various ways to validate the reality of the continuation of consciousness after bodily death. Number one, there are viable apparitions of, quote, dead persons. Number two, communication with dead persons via mediums, and I'm going to add via technological methods. They're now computer-assisted uh, and video-assisted communications with the afterlife. Studies of reincarnated consciousness, near-death experiences, and hypnotic regression to the interlife and prior lives. And that's a photograph of the human aura. And this is just a sample of the literature. There's a vast literature in the parapsychological area. Uh, the uh, British Society for Psychical Research is very uh, well established, uh, as is the American Society for Psychical Research. And there's a whole literature in all of these bodies and some very creative models as to how the world functions that are based on empirical data. And this is just one such case, this is the verif verifiable apparitions of dead persons. Now, this, is, this case, for example, is subjected to multiple interpretations. Okay? So that's why in itself it's not definitive. This is in 1880. Uh, the British Lancers at Alterstead at 7 p.m. The Lancers officers were dining when a woman dressed in a white silk dress and bridal veil entered the dining room and left for the kitchen, wind, kitchen door. This is very con condensed. It's a long case. Women were not permitted in the dining room. Officers recognized the woman as the wife, wife of the regiment veterinarian who had <coughs> died in India during the regiment's tour there. It was the woman who had died. The, the, the wife had died. Her husband was found dead in his bedroom the next morning. Six officers were witnesses to these events. There was no finding of fraud or extrasensory perception. Dr. David Fontana, he's a very good afterlife researcher. So, here a woman comes into the dining room, exits the dining room. She's recognized as the wife of the veterinarian, the regiment veterinarian, but she had died in India. And the next morning, the veterinarian was found dead in his bedroom. So, plausibly, it was some representation of some spirit. You could say maybe it was the wife who was coming back to accompany her husband back through the interdimensional <coughs> portal into the dimension of the afterlife. That's a lot of hypotheses, but it's, that's the type of data that they've been dealing with since 1880. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh, yeah, that's that's just a, a picture of David Mumler, who was in the 1860s one of the uh, leading uh, a leading after death after life, death after life researcher, and that's just a photo of the time to show what they call spirit photography. It, those are, uh, those are two, you're right, those are two different, just to, to show some more examples, yeah. Do you think they tell them that the man in the picture resembles our current speaker? <laughs> Mumbler is the word. <laughs> so, telepathic communication with the consciousness uh, through a medium. Okay, so mediums, they're, they're hazards. The hazards are fraud, 
the medium is using telepathy or super ESP to read the minds of the audience. Uh, you're communicating with an unknown dimensional consciousness which is mimicking the relative in the afterlife. Or there's ambiguity in communications by the medium or its controller. A medium always has like a controlling spirit and it's ambiguous. So there are a lot of, of hazards and fraud in the, in the kind of mediumistic world. And so that's why people are starting to go now to the computer and the video alternative where you're actually achieving communication through, through computer voice or through video with the personality in the afterlife dimension that you wish to contact. Uh, then there's reincarnation studies. Um, the main figure there is Dr. Ian Stevenson who died a few years ago. He was at the University of Virginia Medical School. He has a very wide literature study the reincarnation, and uh, he has developed more than 3,000 cases suggested the reincarnation of children who had conscious memories of a prior, 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 apparent prior lives that can be empirically validated. Uh, the children typically will begin to tell stories of prior lives between the ages of two and five, and will have forgotten about them between eight and nine. And uh, uh, there are children who have died violent deaths in prior lives and uh, leave memories of the mode of death. And this is uh, Dr. Stevenson doing uh, field research in Myanmar. This is a typical case, uh, Parat Sharmi. At two and a half years, he said he had a wife in Muradabad, 60 miles away. In three and a half years, he said he had had a great store, hotel, and movie theater, and was one of the Mohan brothers. He had died from eating too much curd and died in a bathtub. This is three and a half years old. Upon his arrival at Moradabad, Parmo directed his father from the train station to the great <coughs> store and identified his brother Mohan. Paramanad Mohan had died of an intestinal problem after gorging on curd. Uh, Parmad, the child, identified eight key factors in Parmanad's life, some known only to Parmanad and one other person. So that's kind of the archetypal case that is suggestive that this child is, is a reincarnation of this individual and is accessing those memories. Now, there are a lot of alternative interpretations as to how that information, how the child could have gotten that information. But Stevens has argues that most plausibly it's suggestive of the reincarnation model. The interdimensional portal to the dimension of the afterlife, the absence of pain, a feeling of happiness, the instructions on how to return to the body. And for example, um, there's often an option given to the person. I know that to my spouse, Jerry, she was, uh, went through and, and uh, encountered this being and she could put one hand through and see her life on earth if she went back and the other if she did go back. And she saw that she would have two daughters, so she made the choice to go back. So that was her experience. Uh, so you have a lasting conviction on the reality of life after death. Some of the researchers are Dr. David Fontana, Raymond Moody, Dr. Kenneth Ring, John J. Harper, a colleague of ours who passed over uh, recently. Uh, they're not Hallucinations. Hallucinations are usually illogical, fleeting, bizarre, and or distorted, whereas the vast majority of NDEs are logical, orderly, clear, and com comprehensible. 
people tend to forget their hallucinations, whereas most NDE remain vivid for decades. Furthermore, NDEs often lead to profound and permanent transformations in personality, attitudes, beliefs, and values, something that is never seen following hallucinations. People looking back on hallucinations typically recognize them as unreal, as fantasies, whereas people often describe their NDEs as more real than real. Furthermore, people who have experienced both hallucinations and NDEs describe them as being quite different. And NDEs are not the result of anoxia, lack of oxygen, in a dying brain, and that's a clinical opinion. Um, so, uh, Dr. Kenneth Ring has uh, uh, noted, he's taken surveys of people with near-death near experiences and what the lessons that people who go back, who actually transit to the interdimensional portal, have some kind of an interaction there, make a choice to come back, uh, what they, what are some of the attitudes that they, attitudinal changes that they find. Number one, there is nothing to fear about death. Death is beautiful and peaceful. Life, life does not begin with birth, nor end with death. Life is precious, live it to the maximum. The body and its senses are tremendous gifts. Love is the most important thing in life. To live a life built on material acquisition is to miss the point. Cooperation more than competition makes for a better world. Being a great success in life is not all one thinks it might be. Searching, this is one I love <laughs> as a researcher. Searching for knowledge is important. You take knowledge with you after this life. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> so, now, uh, we now go to the intelligent civilization of souls. We're now living among the intelligent civilization of earthling humans, but there's also in the extra-political third dimension of Sol 3, in the solar system Sol in the Milky Way galaxy in the universe Universo. <laughs> I don't know what this universe is called. <laughs> the intelligent, I, you know, it's funny, I've never come up with a name, I've never found a name for this particular, for this particular universe anywhere as yet. If anybody ever comes upon one, please let me know. The intelligent civilizations of souls, life between lives, the spiritual dimensions, what we know and this is just, uh, just a very brief summary of the research, which is very rich, and I find it of great interest. Um, the soul, life between lives. In other words, the model, this is just some background, on, just to recapitulate on the model. The dimensional ecology equals the exopolitical dimensions plus the spiritual dimensions. In the development of a model of a dimensional ecology that includes the exopolitical dimensions, extraterrestrials and hyperdimensionals, and spiritual dimensions, we need data about life in the spiritual dimensions that is verifiable according to the scientific method. In other words, laboratory protocols and replicable results. And that's another version, another illustration of the entrance of the interdimensional, port, in interdimensional portal between, say, Sol 3, our dimensional ecology here on the planet, and the interlife or the afterlife. Hypnotic regression is a process by which an individual accesses memories of her, his life between lives in the spiritual dimension. Hypnotic regression can also be used to access memories of an individual's prior lives in the exopolitical dimension. In other words, you can either remember, have soul memories of the interlife, or you can access memories of prior lives you've had in the, as, as an incarnate in the exopolitical dimensions, when you've kind of gone to school. <coughs> uh, there are other means of independent empirical verification at this time from the spiritual dimension, 
such as instrumental transcommunication, ITC, interdimensional photos, video, computer, and radio transmissions between this dimension and the afterlife dimension. Uh, here are some of the standard treatments that, uh, and this is all based on the 7,000 cases of soul, of uh, reg regression to soul memories of the interlife. Standard treatment, when souls cross over and are received by our guides, the guides generally use two techniques. This is to kind of cushion the blow of leaving this exopolitical third dimension and entering into, as a soul, into the dimension of the interlife. First is envelopment. Souls are enveloped in a large circular mass of energy by their guide. And that kind of, I guess, you know, is, is a way of easing the transition over. There is also the focus effect. As a soul gets closer to the guide, energy is applied to points on the border of the etheric body of the soul. So that would be like some form of spiritual acupressure or acupuncture that is applied to the soul as it's transitioning over. And the guides essentially are advanced souls. In other words, uh, that's one of the jobs. Now, emergency treating at the portal, at the interdimensional uh, doorway to the spiritual dimension occurs when a soul arrives with their energy in a deteriorated state. Uh, physical or spiritual meditation exercises are given to them uh, before the soul moves forward. You know, I, I have this strange thing that changes all, all my words. So I'm sorry, it's supposed to say before instead of beefier. And I have to figure out which button to push to stop this diabolical program that has changed all my words. I'm sorry? Would that be the big man in heaven? <laughs> right. With, with, with the gold arms. <laughs> this happens in cases of violent deaths through accidents, murder, war, etc. And this is, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Michael Newton, who is really a pioneer in this area. And so when you, have, when you die as a result of an accident, a murder, or war, you're met with emergency treatment. And uh, there are, you know, there are a lot of stories about they have special details for airplane crashes and all this kind of stuff on waiting at the interdimensional portal. So this is highly technologized. And some of the central receiving stations on the other side in the interdimensional portal have been described almost like a grand central station of souls. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> okay, I'm there and I'm you know, whizzing in and whizzing out, but you know, uh, one tries to apply one's psychic and visual imagining to what this environment is. Uh, some more of the, these are just some of the research findings that I, I think stood out for me. In a context of total freedom, in other words, one as a soul has a lot of freedom to grow and to Within that context, new souls are assigned to a soul support group based on their level of understanding. By new souls, you mean souls that have been newly created. And they create, anyway, once a soul support group is formed, new soul members are not added in the future. Now, I don't know whether this is an iron rule, but this is what they've reported from the 7,000 cases. Okay, so take all of this with a great caveat. But it's just like, oh, it's kind of a better picture than, you know, harps in heaven, <laughs> I think. Uh, three, there's a process for systematic selection of homogeneous groups of souls. Similarities in ego, cognitive consciousness, expression, and desire are defining consideration. Now, this is something that's interesting. Regardless of size, soul groups do not mix their energy with other soul groups, should groups. I apologize for this. This is some crazy spell check that went nuts. 
Souls can, souls can communicate between themselves. In other words, you can be in a soul group and then you can communicate to other souls, apparently. Uh, now, the learning curve varies among individual souls. In, in other words, although we're all created in this production process out of the sea of light as eggs of light, apparently we're very different. And the learning curve varies among individual souls. Some souls advance more rapidly than others. It really sounds like school. <laughs> At the intermediate level, those that show special talents, healing, creativity, and teaching are authorized to participate in special training while still in their soul groups. At the intermediate level, souls may join together in large independent study groups. At the more advanced level, souls can undertake independent activities outside the group and become to act as guides. So, each of us has been assigned a guide who apparently has a great deal of influence on, they're sort of like our mentor. And we, they're involved in our choice of lives for the following life. They're involved in our life reviews. They're involved in, you know, they're, they're kind of mentoring us. And they, in turn, have been souls that are training. So it's kind of like co-creating, co-teaching, co-counseling. Um, the creation of souls, again, comes from the egg of light. Uh, death and exit is floating above the, the body. In, in other words, through hypnotic re regression, there's a lot of confirmation of the following phenomena. That the creation of souls come, is this egg of light from the sea of light. That death and exit from this dimension, you can see the body, the soul can float above the body. The entry portal to the spiritual dimension appears as a tunnel with a light at the end and a, and a portal. Uh, when one crosses over, typically, although not totally, because in the case of advanced souls who are leading, maybe typically leading multiple lives at once, say, see, four or five lives at once, in multiple time frames, they may prefer to just like enter and lead covertly. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of different levels and ways to relate to your incarnations. So that, but typically, if you're kind of in the regular, you know, let's say a mainstream type of incarnation, you're met by your guide and your family members, so some of the soul family members, kind of meet and greet and the whole thing. Uh, a disoriented soul uh, may lead to a lot of trauma and to the ghost phenomena. Uh, there's a, in terms of uh, transitions, uh, there's a rehearsal area so that, uh, for example, if, if we uh, choose a certain incarnation uh, and we're going to incarnate in groups and, you know, certain of our groups are incarnate together, there's training so that when we meet members of our soul group during the incarnation, we can recognize them. There's all sorts of trainings that, that, that go on. You know, this is a very rehearsed drama that we're in. Much more than we think so, because we have that artificial amnesia that's induced in, in, into it. Uh, and different sort of placements, and our guides are very complex entities because they're highly evolved souls along the ladder of evolution. Uh, and so it's good to give gratitude to, you know, when you're thanking everybody, thank your guide. It's just good, a good thing to do because the guide has put in a lot of work on your behalf. Uh, according to their figures, the research of the 7,000 cases on Earth, for example, there would be 42% are beginner souls, 
57% are intermediate souls, 1% are advanced or elevated souls. In life selection, you have the freedom to select your next life. Uh, but the selection of lives is a very complicated process and you spend a lot of time in it. You, there's a process where you have previews of your coming life, like you go into a room and they'll have monitors and you can sample what different lives are going to be like through the monitor. Well, you know, life A, B, and C, oh, do I want this one, do I want that one? There's preparation for the voyage, the recognition courses I just mentioned. Uh, in terms of rebirth, in the typical case, you will spend two or three months close to the new body. You notice right, right up by the mother and by the fetus, and then you are, you are enmeshed into the fetus just before birth, according to this data. Uh, he says, I have an extensive file on souls that have incarnated in other worlds and souls that have traveled in a variety of unknown worlds for study and recreation between their lives on earth. In other words, that we do not incarnate solely here on earth. We choose a variety of incarnations throughout the exopolitical dimensions. We can incarnate as birds on bird planets, as fish on fish planets, as mammals, as humans, as cats, or, you know, wide variety. Uh, here are some of, here's one particular regression that says, do you work only with souls who come to earth? This is of a guy. He says, yes. But I could go to many places, types of places. Only a fraction come from Earth. We identify worlds of pleasure and worlds of suffering. Earth is apparently a world of suffering. <laughs> now, this is to just begin to introduce, because we, we have that data, right? So it seems like if you're in the mainstream, well, I guess that that's kind of what happens. But then we have all of this other data which shows an alternative soul treatment. So I decided to call it soul technology, the E.T. Gray soul technology, because it appears as though this may be a bending of the rules of the laws of non-interference. I don't know, but I have, I have a suspicion that it may be. And that is that a certain group of greys, I do not believe that they are the Orion greys, appear to have developed the capacity for uh, uh, housing and, you know, operating with human souls and enmeshing them in human bodies and creating human destinies uh, around fetuses and around bodies. Apparently you go on a grey ship and you see a bunch of things hanging around a thing like a coat rack and there are human bodies. And then you can animate them by putting a soul in them. So this game is far beyond what our conventional religious texts te teach us, what our kind of common human culture has taught us, what our none of the major, you know, from Hinduism to Buddhism have really grappled with this. And this comes, uh, uh, Suzanne Hansen, uh, she's the head of uh, the UFO organization in New Zealand, and these are her pictures. Uh, she first met her soul, the soul of her son, aboard a great ET spacecraft when she was only eight years old, and her son appeared as a ball of light. And that's her, a depiction of her on the great ET spacecraft with a bunch of other kids playing with her son's soul as a ball of light. In the interview, she reveals that later in life, after she was married and pregnant with her son, she was taken aboard an ET spacecraft where she met her souls once more as a ball of light. On this occasion, her son's soul was inserted into her womb and her son's body in a procedure by the gray ET, who also gave her deep information about the future positive social role 
her son would play on Earth. He's now a 27-year-old lawyer in New Zealand. He does not have yet reacquired memories of the spaceship experiences, but he is going to when he's about mid-30s, and he's going to have a significant role in New Zealand or all over the world, as far as we know. He's now a 27-year-old lawyer in New Zealand. He does not have yet reacquired memories of the spaceship experiences, but he is going to when he's about mid-30s, and he's going to have a significant role in New Zealand or all over the world, as far as we know. Uh, throughout her life, Ms. Hansen states that experiences with the Green Tees were, quote, transformational, purposeful, and positive. But this is very, very far from the heaven depicted in the Bible, from the heaven depicted by any religious tradition that I know of. And yet, it's scientific data. It's data that is credible. And that conforms with other cases. Uh, in drawing number one, this shows the large room in which I played. This is Suzanne. Uh, she was eight years old with the children of mixed species using, these are mixed species children, using mind games to facilitate telepathic communications between us. The interesting thing is that I could see the objects being produced by our minds with both my mind and my eyes. In another regression I did with Mary, this is uh, the ET, Australian ET researcher, Mary Rodwell, uh, who researched this case. I described being taught to project a hologram from my mind into the air in front of me. You will note a strange bread in this drawing with a baby on it and a grave beside it. I have nicknamed this the lullaby bed and also features another chapter. Mary regressed me to six months old where I could see myself lying on this bed or piece of technology. In other words, her eight year, visit as an eight-year-old wasn't her first visit. She was first, you know, she was there as a six-month-old infant. So this is a, a lot of nurturing of this infant to an eight-year-old where they introduce her to the soul of her son, then they bring her back when she's pregnant and married, and enmesh the soul and tell her what the soul's destiny is. This is the second drawing with me as an eight-year-old learning to relate to the soul of my future son, the ball of light, through play, chasing it around the room while the greys observed to see if we would be suited. That's what I call gray ET's soul technology. That's very advanced technology that has to do with the dimension of the interlife and of the spiritual dimension, query. Is this a bending of the rule of non-interference? Drawing. Third drawing shows two entities, mixtures of greys and another species, comforting me as a grey, and this is a special grey who came in as, to do the procedure, begins a calming procedure to lower my metabolism prior to the soul of my son entering my body and that of my unborn child. So this is a regular procedure. They bring them infants, you know, I would imagine. They have souls up there. They mix and match the child and the soul. Then when the child is uh, married and pregnant or whatever, they bring up the woman and they have an enmeshment, specialized enmeshment procedure with a specialized gray who specializes in enmeshing souls and bodies. I think that's soul technology. So here we have a gray civilization that's intervening in the most intimate and sentient, most intimate of our existential processes at the soul level. Now, here's where it gets a little bit hairy. This is Michael Prince. He describes visiting underground bases on Earth in which Orion Gray ETs have human souls held prisoner in technological prisons. It's not a pretty picture. Mr. Prince states that the Orion Gray ETs have advanced cloning and soul merging technology, 
so that humans' clones can be mixed and matched for maximal effect in the deceptive military industrial extraterrestrial complex. The Draco reptilian ETs, human beings may be sought as captives for number one, consumption of the human body as flesh, and number two, enslavement of the human soul to lower order reptilian hells. Now, Mr. Prince alleges certain things that are really, I mean, they are way out there. And I'll give you one of the way out there ones, just so you can have outer limits to what this thing is. And that is that the hale bopp Comet in 1997, according to him, was followed by a gray extraterrestrial mothership. Excuse me, by Draco reptilian extraterrestrial mothership. And that the greys, the Orion greys, went out and met the Draco reptilian mothership with a tribute of 100,000 humans. Humans. So, as, as, as tribute. As a process. Yeah, you know, as a tribute. So, I, I just want to throw out that data point to show you what we're dealing with, because ultimately they say that the survival dynamics of the human race is superior to that of the Draco reptilians and the Greys, and we will win. However, I believe we will win under conditions of informed consent, not under conditions of being kept ignorant, mind controlled, and in a daze. So therefore, I think people have to be informed of the facts, and then our survival dynamics will kick in it's just logical. So that's the purpose of passing on information like this. I can't verify the information, but a credible whistleblower has stated it. Okay, now we're in the, we're in the uh, home stretch. What are the 20 implications of the dimensional ecology of the multiverse? And I've got 20 minutes. Number one, exopolitics. This is like, what, the, the top 10 countdown <laughs> on Lena, or what is it? Yeah, Lena. Number one, exopolitics, the science of relations among intelligent civilizations, is the proper discipline for a new typology of intelligent civilizations. In other words, I would submit that we're back to, prior to Samaria, before religion supplanted exopolitics. That's the historical significance of this moment in time. Number two, dimensionality. Dimensionality appears to be the key criterion by which extraterrestrial civilizations in the multiverse should be typed, and that's how they ought to describe themselves. Number three, human consciousness. Earthly human consciousness and our ability to comprehend the dimensionality and political organization of intelligent life in the multiverse, or exopolitical organization, is a key to our future evolution as an organized species in the society of organized intelligent life in the multiverse. The degree to which we are conscious and we can comprehend dimensionality and how intelligent life is organized exopolitically and dimensionally, that's a key to our own evolution because that's how the multiverse is organized. Um, Number four, the Martian civilization. By the evidence, earthling human society first overt exopolitical steps as a society should be the establishment of transparent public interest planetary relations with the third dimensional solar system, human, humanoid, human civilization living under and on the surface of Mars. Number five, transformation of earthling power, economic, social structure. The power economic and social structure on Earth may go through at least three stages from 2011 to 2025. Number one, collapse the New World Order somewhere roughly between 2011 and 2014, 15, 16, 15. One world government and antichrist world king, just to use the word, or, you know, non-God oriented uh, world king. Uh, 2015 or so, 2018 to 2025, 
the landing of heaven on earth and Christ's Sophia consciousness. Those are very, very subjective time frames and very, very subjective stages. But I think that the 2011 to 2025 time frame is relatively accurate. Whistleblower and eyewitnesses. The personal courage and contributions to exopolitical science and a positive human future of whistleblower and eyewitness witnesses such as Andrew D. Bishago, Arthur Neumann, Michael Relf, Laura Magdalene Eisenhower, and William Brett Stilling should be acknowledged by Earthling Human Society. I think we should, it should be probably acknowledged. Number seven, the new typology of extraterrestrial civilizations and extraterrestrial disclosure. The new typology of extraterrestrial civilizations will facilitate and accelerate the comprehension of UFO and extraterrestrial related data and information by the earthly human public and scientific governmental, educational, and media organizations. This new typology will accelerate the pace of extraterrestrial disclosure, including disclosure by the extraterrestrial civilizations themselves. Number eight, Homo sapiens of the Galactic Council. Homo sapiens was created, possibly by the Atlantis, as a unique 3D light beam with 12 strand DNA and with DNA activation is now recovering its original blueprint and consciousness. Nine, dimensional ecologies. This is the dimensional ecology hypothesis, which we believe that the evidence presented tonight is on its way to supporting the hypothesis. We earthlings live in a dimensional ecology of intelligent life that encompasses extraterrestrials and parallel dimensions and universes, souls in the afterlife dimensions, spiritual beings in the spiritual dimensions, and souls within a multiverse, or all that is. Ten, soul. The common denominator of all these dimensions is the human soul. The human soul inhabits the spiritual dimension between lives and the exopolitical dimension during lives, and may lead several exopolitical lives simultaneously. Eleven, exopolitical lives may be as a human on Earth or as an intelligent being on another planet, universe, or dimension. Twelve, soul types. There may be other types of intelligent souls that our science will discover. Thirteen, soul technology slash soul wars. The gray ETs, whatever the species is, appear to have a significant role in soul coordination and implantation, some of which must be stopped and human souls liberated. I'm referring to the human souls that are in prison. I don't know, maybe they're bad souls, but you know, I don't know what's going on. Fourteen, gray soul technology. Living humans report meeting deceased relatives on gray and other ET ships. In other words, the grays seem to have taken over a number of the functions of the afterlife. They seem to have invaded the spiritual dimension or the afterlife dimension. So, and I'm not totally comfortable with that, and I believe that that needs to come to public knowledge and may be part of the uh, Orion Gray reptilian attempted occupation of human reality. Now, 15, education. Human now, humanity now is being misinformed about the true nature of the soul life after death, and the mechanisms of reincarnation. Sixteen, religions are a large source of erroneous information about the nature of the soul and the interlife and spiritual dimension. This misinformation is based on texts that are not correct and yet are considered sacred as a matter of faith. Religion <coughs> supplanted exopolitics with the Anunnaki conquest at Sumeria. So, Exopolitics should now supplant religion. 17, academic science prohibits teaching the reality of life after death, even though empirical evidence support this hypothesis and reality. And that's true. I mean, I couldn't get approval for this. What you've just witnessed is actually a curriculum of the philosophy of exopolitics that I was asked to present by university in British Columbia. And when they saw it, they prohibited it. 
Uh, academic science prohibits the teaching of the reality of life after death, even though empirical science supports this hypothesis and reality. Therefore, modern science is also a source of erroneous information about the soul and the intralife. 18. Cultural and religious conflict are the result of imposed ignorance about the scientific reality of the nature of the soul and the intralife. The science of spirit can demonstrate the true nature of the human soul and its spiritual and exopolitical dimensions. 19. Science and spirituality. The coming together of science and spirituality will return science to the proper study and understanding of the human soul. A return to the supremacy of understanding over ignorance. This is our duty as informed, aware souls. 20. The dimensional ecology of the multiverse is itself a multidimensional model for recognition and classification of ongoing research into intelligent civilizations in the exopolitical and spiritual dimensions. Caveat lector. This presentation contains only a representative sample of empirical data in each category of the dimensional ecology of exopolitical and spiritual dimensions. Thank you very much for your attention. Your, your soul, your etheric body are going into non-local dimensions and are having real experiences. Some of them, it varies from individual to individual because some of them are psychological dreams, some are spiritual dreams, some are actual inter interactions. Yeah. When you were talking about, um, okay, two aspects, going through the tunnel and then meeting your guide, or you could end up going through the tunnel and see, you meet a grape. <laughs> and then about the people that were all given up as food, right, for these ETs. Yeah. When they die, I mean, do they lose their soul or do they end up going down the tunnel and seeing their guide or... No, in other words, how do yeah, you know? these are these are open questions, and they're very serious questions. And from what I take it from listening to whistleblowers like Michael Prince, who is concerned about the fate of human souls that are being held prisoner in underground prisons by the great ETs, is that is that you know we can have weak souls, and and there are souls that are being deceived. And so that if we have the people, if the if people in the waking human population are buying into the New World Order, are buying into the matrix, they say, oh, she lost her soul because she took that job or something, or he lost his soul because he took that job. Well, that's true. In other words, you may weaken your soul to a certain extent such that it's less, it's more susceptible to being annihilated or imprisoned or consumed by a predator. So that uh, uh, this is a new realm, and I'm not trying to inject fear, I'm just trying to inject awareness. Yeah. I was wondering if you're familiar with the, the Gnosticism, which was the pre Christian belief system. Uh, the whole theory of archons, which is basically the idea that, that what we call reptilians, draconians now, are actually archons, and they were discovered many, many years ago, over 2,000 years ago, as an inorganic mind energy form that was not from God, from source. And this is how the whole spin-off of evil came about, that it's, a, that it's an inorganic mind entity or being that came before humans. Yeah. It's intelligent, this but not but not some kind of physical force out there of uh, alien creatures that are coming in to, to wage war and, you know, this whole... Right, thing. right. This is one of the great lessons that I've learned from my colleague, Laura, and also people like Dr. John Lash. Yeah. And uh, I haven't fully achieved an integration between the, uh, the uh, knowledge of the archons and exopolitical research because I'm not sure that people have carried out empirical research around the archons. A lot of people speaking to people who have been seeing shadow beings, you know, crawling around. Um, 
And so I think that that's a great unknown yet. And uh, what the integration of Gnosticism with exopolitics is going to be, I think is going to yield a very fruitful field. But that certainly there will be advances in both, our knowledge of Gnosticism and concepts like the Archons, and of exopolitics. Because on exopolitics, we're, we're dealing with solid empirical data of different races and manifestations uh, and to say that they're just the current manifestation of the Archon, uh, while I've read that literature, it does not yet in my mind seem to go beyond and address the existing empirical evidence of the nature that I've begun to present here today. Um, maybe that influences the most manifestations like the British Crown uh, or things like that, or some of the graves, but I, so yes, that's a key question, and the answer is, I don't know, because it's just an open area of research, and I don't, I haven't found yet any handles onto the Archon, because it's not empirically based, it's kind of a metaphysical literature, at least so far as I've explored it. And does it really make sense to me that it's a, it's a system of an inorganic mind system that is basically doing things, I guess you could say, in a sense, to humans or to to our world based on deception and uh, yeah. what we call counter-mimicry. So a lot of things come into people's minds, and I'm not saying that those things aren't real, but yeah. they're real in a No, no, I, I think that archons may be part of the mix, but they're not the whole cake. <laughs> if that's a correct metaphor. I don't know. <laughs> okay, you know, thank you very much, and let's have a great meditation.